call the Health and Human Services Committee meeting to order. Um, can we have the roll call, please, Madam Clerk? Commissioner Marecki? Here. Commissioner Dobb? Here. Commissioner Anderson? Here. Commissioner Colleen? Yep, here. Chair Baker McCormick? I am here. Next item, please. B, Chairwoman's remarks. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will be reviewing a three month status report of the ME's office. And we all know that this is a uh, very important uh, to us and to families in Wayne County, also Macomb actually. Um, so let's get to it. Next item. C, approval of the January 25th, 2022 meeting minutes. Is there a motion? Move for approval. Support. Support. All right, it's been moved and supported. All those in favor? Aye. All right, any opposed? All right, motion passed. Next item, please. D, finished business, there is none listed. Okay, next item. Item one, under new business, discussion from the medical examiner's office providing a three-month report on improving its handling of the deceased. All right. Um, who do we have that wants uh, to start first, I guess? Uh, Commissioner Baker McCormick, uh, this is Jeff Myers, and um, I will start. Is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, it is, Mr. Myers. And your title, please, for the record. I am Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs and Quality in the Department of Pathology at uh, the University of Michigan Medical School. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could butt in here for a sec. Sure. Uh, could, I believe it was Mr. Myers from University of Michigan. I have not seen this report uh, and I always hate uh, learning about it this way, cold. Uh, does Mr. Myers have someone on staff that can email this report to us right now? Uh, I think it'll be easier for me to follow and perhaps ask questions later. Um, certainly. I, I don't know that we have your email address, Melita. Is that something? Well, I haven't yeah, seen it. Yeah, I, I understand. Seen. Madam Chair, may I speak? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, My name is Melita Jordan, Jordan, and I am the director for the Department of Health, Human, and Veteran Services. <coughs> I'd like to uh, submit to the commission that this report was sent uh, to the committee, uh, to the appropriate uh, commission uh, members as required. And so it was, it was sent at, um, on Friday. Okay, I must have missed it because it didn't come with the agenda. All right, I'll go take a look for it. Sorry it's about that, Madam Chair. If I have it, it came Friday, I'll find it. Thank you. Okay, um, and Mr. Myers, before you go into detail um, uh, about this report, can you tell us um, how you fit in to the, to the ME's office for Wayne County? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, if I may, I'd like to begin by thanking you, Commissioner uh, Baker McCormick and, and the commissioners of the Committee on Health and Human Services for the invitation to provide this three-month follow-up on the corrective action plan that we shared with you in October. As I said, I'm uh, here in my capacity as Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs and Quality in the Department of Pathology at the University of Michigan, which means that the directors of our clinical divisions report to me on our organizational chart. That includes the division of anatomic pathology, which is the division in which the section of autopsy and forensic pathology lives. So um, this uh, is um, uh, a, a part of our 
clinical enterprise that reports to the vice chair for clinical affairs and quality. Um, in my previous role as director of the Division of Anatomic Pathology, uh, this was a model that um, I, I played a significant role in developing. Okay, and so when you say you are uh, also uh, over the clinical affairs and quality, are you saying that you are basically the, the person to go to as to the quality of services in Wayne County and the ME's office? Uh, that is a collaborative effort, but is certainly appropriate um, for that conversation to bubble up to me. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Certainly. Um, and before we get started on our presentation, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, recent reports of other families affected by problems at the medical examiner's office. Um, and uh, we want to be very clear to the commissioners that we grieve for these families uh, because we believe that every case and every family deserves compassion, respect, and closure. And while I think it's important to understand that these reported incidents account for 0.02%, that is a little more than two for every 10,000 of the more than 33,000 cases cared for at the medical examiner's office over the 11 year period from which these incidents were distilled, we are determined that these be never events um, as we continue working in earnest on a comprehensive improvement plan in fact, we're here today to share progress made on that plan since October. Um, and we are happy to take your questions regarding these recent reports at the conclusion of our presentation. Uh, joining me for today's presentation are Dr. Alicia Wilson. She's our Director of Autopsy and Forensic Services in the Department of Pathology uh, at Michigan Medicine, and Dr. Carl Schmidt who is both Wayne County Medical Examiner and Professor of Pathology at the University of Michigan Medical School. Uh, and with that, um, Dr. Wilson, I will, I will hand this over to you. Thank you, Dr. Myers, and thank you to the commissioners for the opportunity to give you this update. Next slide. The Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office, Michigan Medicine, and the Department of Pathology remain committed to providing the best possible service to the loved ones of the decedents entrusted in our care. We are continuously improving our operations and welcome the opportunity to collaborate with all parties to enhance the work we do together. For today's report, we would like to focus on three areas related to the Wayne County MEO's operations in the areas of new faculty recruitment, name reaccreditation, and the end of the year activity and performance metrics. The next segment will focus on the corrective actions initiated since our presentation in 2021. Key findings in the areas of faculty recruitment. There are currently only about 400 to 500 physicians who practice forensic pathology full time. This is less than half of the estimated needed to cover the United States. The challenges we face include the opioid crisis and the current pandemic that has taken a tremendous toll on the already strained, understaffed and under-resourced medical legal death investigation system. Collaboration and communication between forensic practitioners and their stakeholders are currently impaired at several points. A needs assessment conducted by the U.S. Department of Justice in 2019 cited promising practices including regionalization of ME and coroner's offices, consolidation of medical legal death investigation services, and what we now share between our offices, innovative collaborations that expand the scope and impact of medical legal resources. Other practices include strategic partnerships to increase engagement with medical students to go into the field of pathology, and also with forensic science programs to increase candidates going into the medical legal death investigation um, ancillary positions. Currently, we are at full staff with seven forensic pathologists, 
we have a number of pathologists, assist, assistants, medical legal, death investigators, autopsy assistants, photographers, administrative staff, and managerial staff. This is increased from our prior report in October, 2021. Dr. Schmidt will give the name reaccreditation update and the end of the year statistics. So we had the name inspection on December 13th of uh, 2021, uh, the end December 14th. And we received uh, a report on January 7th, uh, giving a preliminary recommendation for provisional accreditation, uh, but they wanted clarification on uh, several items, which we submitted on January 28th, and we have not yet heard back from them. So that's still pending. Uh, as far as numbers go, um, this is a bar chart showing our number of reported cases versus the number of autopsies that we do every year. And that's in the uh, smaller orange chart. Um, and the number of days that uh, cases are actually spending in the morgue, and as you can see, uh, the number of days that uh, a body actually spends in our facility has continuously declined uh, over the years. Uh, even uh, in 2020, in 2021, we actually had um, fewer days than 2020 and 2020 had actually fewer days than uh, 2019 for the average case to remain here, which was uh, in retrospect surprising because uh, from March through May during the pandemic, we had a lot of cases coming in. Um, next slide. And I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about the numbers. This is the uh, latest uh, year for which we have uh, full uh, data, uh, which is 2020. Uh, we had 19,143 death reports. We had 3,622 of those cases actually brought into the office. 72.3% uh, or 2,600 more or less actually had complete autopsies. And the rest were inspections uh, or a small number were limited autopsies, uh, skeletonized remains and so on and so forth. And accidents were, um, and natural disease were our largest uh, categories. Uh, you can see that uh, accidents and natural disease account for about the same number of cases, which is, uh, what is what we've seen in the prior years, we had 441 homicides um, and uh, 248 suicides, 72 were actually uh, indeterminate. Of our accidents, uh, we had 995 drug deaths. This number continues uh, to increase from year to year. And for 2021, we're going to have also close to 1,000 drug deaths. Thank you, um, Carl and, and Lisa. Um, we want to transition from um, an update on our current state to talk about the areas of improvement that were the focus of our conversation in October. Um, and as was true then remains true today. It's been true for the 10 years that we've had our relationship. Um, no family should have to contend with the issues that have surfaced at the Wayne County Morgue. And we're committed to continuously improving our operations um, and are um, anxious to share with you the comprehensive action plan previously shared in October, 2021. As you may recall, there were two focus areas in that plan. Uh, the first uh, focused on delays in identification and notification, uh, which accounted for um, most of the incidents that were occupying our attention in October but there were also issues with decomposition. Uh, uh, at that time, we committed to creating a new scene investigator position, a full-time position to manage our unidentified cases. Um, I'm happy to report to the commissioners that that new position has been created and filled for that identification coordinator. In addition, as an additional layer, 
uh, lead investigators uh, will be assigned to each shift uh, a change that is effective in March of this year. Uh, we also committed to the commissioners that we would audit the decedents uh, currently at the medical examiner's office. Um, and uh, I want to report that all unidentified decedents since our last report have been cross-referenced using a combination of missing person reports. Uh, they've been fingerprinted when possible and uh, when appropriate, entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, often abbreviated as NamUs, uh, when appropriate, meaning if all other measures had failed. And we continue to do continuous internal audits focused on all of our unidentified decedents. Uh, we committed at that time to creating a public facing web-based portal to both broadcast unidentified decedents and to solicit the public's participation in linking to their missing loved ones and friends. I'm happy to report that that prototype for a public web website has been built. It is undergoing review and revision by stakeholders, including a large comprehensive review by a large stakeholder group last Friday. Uh, and uh, pending input of a focus group, uh, we anticipate that that will be live and available on our website soon. Uh, we committed to expanding licenses to allow all of our scene investigators individual access to a database important to this work. Uh, and since our October meeting, individual database licenses have been purchased for all of those investigators. Uh, we committed to you that we would train and annually assess the competencies of our scene investigators since then, we have initiated what is actually weekly training to ensure the competency of all scene investigators. And that is under the direction of one of our um, physician pathologists who serves as assistant uh, medical examiner. We committed to creating a dashboard for monthly operations staff meetings so that we could monitor in a more real-time basis the census over time including releases, uh, unclaimed and unidentified bodies, our own turnaround time, and adverse events or near misses uh, like the incidents that have focused our attention over the last few months. I'm happy to report that that work is in progress, although not yet complete. We also committed to review of key quality indicators as a standing agenda item for our quarterly meetings uh, with uh, Wayne County uh, and uh, those key quality indicators have been added to those agendas um, and will be an important part of maintaining accountability for the quality of the work that occurs in the office. We also committed to collaborating with the University of Michigan College of Engineering, asking them to assess the systems and procedures at the medical examiner's office to identify improvement opportunities, understanding that sometimes having others come in to review our work can be helpful in identifying opportunities to which we may have become desensitized. Uh, since we last met, we have um, collaborated with Dr. Amy Kahn, who's faculty director for our Center for Healthcare Engineering and Patient Safety, and that project was launched on January 16th. A project manager and coordinator have been assigned to that work and the team's first visit has been scheduled for February 14th at the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office. In terms of issues with decompensation, uh, we committed that the temperature controls and monitors would be installed in morgue refrigerators for real-time monitoring and automated alerts. That work continues to be done manually uh, because of number two, which was a decision for equipment replacement. We did in fact commit to evaluating the refrigeration equipment to determine whether it requires replacement or repair as part of planned renovations. Those coolers and freezers were evaluated in January, 2022 
by a cross-functional team that included folks from the medical examiner's office, from Wayne County facilities, and from DLZ. And the team confirmed that the equipment was at end of life and needed replacement. That has been included in the equipment budget for the medical examiner's office renovation project scheduled for 2023, about which I suspect you will learn more in succeeding meetings. One of the contributors to issues of decompensation with uh, one of the decedents we discussed in October was a failure of backup generators in the midst of the June 2021 flooding. We committed to analyzing uh, that failure to understand how we might flood proof our emergency operations. Since we met in October, that backup generator transfer switch has been replaced by Wayne County and that happened in December. So that is the work um, that is ongoing. That is the progress we've made uh, since we spoke in October. And I wanna bring this formal presentation to a close with the same commitment with which we opened. And that is that the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office, Michigan Medicine, and the University of Michigan Department of Pathology remain committed to providing the best possible service to the loved ones of the decedents who are entrusted to our care. We are continuously improving our operations and we welcome the opportunity to collaborate with all parties to enhance the work uh, that we do together. Um, Thank you for your attention, Commissioner Baker McCormick and the members of the Committee of Health and Human Services. And, and we are happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Myers, for that uh, presentation and to Dr. Smith and Ms. Uh, Wilson. Um, so there has been other uh, issues that that have came to light, um, you're probably aware of them by now, um, that we're really unhappy about. And um, I'm, I'm, I was hoping that we would hear some um, other solutions um, in this report. And um, so I just wanna clarify a couple of things. And I want to have also the public address um, uh, address you in some of the their concerns. So we'll we'll have some public comments uh, after the commissioners. Um, so one of the questions I wanted to clarify is when you talked about the key quality indicators that would be addressed, um, you really didn't talk about what those key quality indicators that um, are set on your agenda, what those would be or are. So could you explain that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I will tell you that I am not directly involved in that work, so I don't know that detailed response. Uh, but I can certainly send it to you and engage members of the team who are accountable for that work. Okay. Um, yeah, because that, that's important to know uh, what quality indicators or what, what issues that you're working on and, and how that will change the direction in which we're, we've been going here, which is um, uh, not very uh, good from the reports that, that I have. And because you know this is a very sensitive and important issue to families, um, how we deal with uh, death and dying is, um, is of concern to us. Um, the other question I wanted to clarify is you stated that the refrigerators are at the end of their life. Um, how many refrigerators do we currently have and how long have we had them? 
Uh, yes, and again, that's a level of detail at which I don't operate, but um, I would ask Dr. Schmidt if, if he um, knows the answer to that question. We have uh, two refrigerators, one intake and one exit refrigerator. And on top of that, there are four freezers. Okay, and so when we uh, were talking about the lifespan of a refrigerator, we were just looking at the two refrigerators and not the freezer. And is, is there a lifespan issue with the freezers or is it just there, the refrigerator? There is because two of the freezers are the same age as the building. This building uh, was inaugurated in 1995 and uh, the, refrigerator, the refrigerators have been upgraded since then, but the equipment per se is actually, um, 27 years old, basically. Uh, there are two newer freezers, but those freezers were installed somewhere around 2006 or 2007, if I remember right. Um, but the main refrigeration equipment, it dates from 1995. Okay. And um, Dr. Smith, how long have you been uh, with the county? Since 1994. Okay. All right. So you have a long history of um, knowledge of uh, what is um, possibly needed. And you would say that we need a new refrigerator and freezer then at this point. Yes. And I think it's part of uh, the engineering firm's assessment of the building and is a recommendation for the okay. renovations. Okay, yes, because we're currently in the middle of an, an audit and that probably will uh, come out of the, the audit report as well. Um, okay, and then um, the other question I had, uh, as we talked about uh, last week, it was the processing of death certificates as well as uh, cremation permits. Can you tell us and explain to us the process of that and why it may or may not take um, as long to process certain cases uh, where others it um, takes no time at all or a short time? Uh, so for death certificates, uh, death certificates are issued on the day that the autopsy is done or we see the body if it's just an inspection. So those are available on that day. Our database will print out uh, the death certificate and the pathologist in charge of the autopsy room that day will sign it. And that death certificate goes with the body when the body is picked up. Um, there are some cases that take uh, that will have a, a cause of death as pending, and the time it takes to unpend the case will depend on a number of issues, um, which vary significantly from uh, case to case. Okay, uh, can you just give us an example of, of a case where it would vary and it might take longer than others? So, so for example, if you died from, a, let's say, a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, and we find the changes in the heart that are associated with that, we will say on the death certificate that it was a myocardial infarction and that's on the same day. Uh, but if it's a drug death and it happens to be uh, one of the drugs that has recently been introduced into the community, which has been a problem since around 2015, especially with the fentanyls, because uh, there are many derivatives of fentanyl that have been introduced into the community. There are actually hundreds of them across the country. And the, it, it takes time for the toxicology lab, uh, sometimes two or three months to be able to characterize exactly which of those new drugs it is uh, that is present in the, in the deceased's blood. Uh, then there's uh, cases that had long hospital stays. We have cases that come in with two and 3,000 page medical records. Um, there are some cases that require special considerations, such as child abuse. Uh, those 
uh, require separate um, a separate procedure, uh, which can take a couple of months uh, before we can actually uh, finish up the case. Uh, so it's a mixture of that. Uh, usually medical records or somebody needs uh, a laboratory test that is not part of the routine or a new drug is encountered in the community. Okay, so that could delay uh, a funeral home from receiving the, the deceased or getting a uh, cremation permit if you're waiting on additional documents. Is that what you're saying? No, you can get, you, the, the, the body can be picked up immediately even if the cause of death is pending. That is not an impediment for picking up the body. And you can cremate the body with a cause of death as pending. And it in fact, it, it happens all the time. So the cause of death being pending does not in any way interfere with the funeral proceedings. Okay, and what's the usual timeline if everything is um, uh, in order, you have all of, all of the documentation, what's the timeline for uh, a funeral home or uh, a family to have the body released with the death certificate or a uh, cremation permit? Well, cremation permits are separate, uh, but a body can be released on the same day as the autopsy. Okay. And some people actually will pick up their relative's body on the same day uh, as the autopsy. Uh, most people uh, will delay it somewhere between three to five days, depending on what kind of funeral arrangements they have, they, they make and with what funeral home they end up with. And so what is our timeline, our usual timeline for that process? Um, well, as you saw in that bar chart, our, our average uh, stay is now down to about eight days. Uh, so most people, an average number of people will be uh, here only for around eight days. Okay, so if a funeral home is requesting documentation that is needed, um, you're saying they, they need to wait eight days or? No, 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 that's the time of, that's the length of time that a body is actually here before it's uh, released from the office. A body can be released on the day of the autopsy so that we do the autopsy, we will issue the death certificate, whether it says pending or with a definite cause of death, and uh, the body can be released the afternoon that we did the autopsy. Okay, so you're saying to get a death certificate or cremation permit, it can take one day if everything is in order. Just or the they, death just the okay. death certificate. Cremation okay. permits are a separate process. Okay. So is that the usual amount of time that it, that it takes a, a, a day? Yes, we will the issue death. the death certificate on the afternoon of the day that we do the autopsy. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. All right. Um, let's see. Vice Chair Commissioner Colleen had a question. Go right ahead. Or maybe even two, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of reports and a lot of discussions going on with the ME's office recently. So I, I want to get a framework here. Uh, later this calendar year, the contract with the U of M uh, to provide these services will be up and we'll be looking at a, a new contract. Uh, Prior to that, the Auditor General uh, for Wayne County uh, has on her audit list uh, an audit that she's going to be doing that hopefully will be shared with the committee maybe this summer in preparation for that. Now, today, we have a PowerPoint presentation that was characterized as a corrective action plan. If that is true, then what we have is uh, an audit from a little while ago, uh, four or five months. So what I wanna do is uh, 
to have a, a history here so committee members can follow this and understand what they're seeing. Uh, Mr. Myers, uh, this is a corrective action plan uh, in response to what audit, sir? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Clean. It's not in response to an audit. It's in response to the incidents that brought us to you in October. Yeah. So it was coming out of discussion. Uh, yes. When you characterize this corrective action plan, I, I use that language all the time, so it means something different to me. Uh, and, and also, uh, maybe to inform this discussion a little bit, Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to ask... Uh, uh, the Auditor General, Marcy Cora, uh, if some of the things that we've talked about here so far uh, are gonna be part of the audit she's doing, some of these issues uh, to look into, uh, because uh, I always like to wait and get an audit, something in my hands, not necessarily digital, uh, to look at uh, from the Auditor General uh, and that can be more of a basis for questioning and understanding what's going on uh, or not in the ME's office. Uh, so, Madam Chair, is it appropriate to uh, have the Auditor General uh, briefly outline the kind of issues her audit's going to be looking at? Yes, that would be fine, Marcy. Go sure. right mm -hmm. and please excuse my voice. I'm suffering from COVID a little bit. Um, we began, we put I, this medical just, exam. For the record, yep, can yep. you give your name and title, full name? Sure, Mar Marcy Cora, Auditor General. We had the medical examiner's office on our audit plan for last year because we knew the contract was coming up for renewal this year. So we were going to do an audit similar to we did with the Correct Care Solutions, where we determine whether the key contract provisions are being adhered to. So that's how we had originally planned this engagement. When all the issues came to light, we've changed our scope a little bit. We're also not only including the contract compliance issues, but we're also gonna look at the other processes over identification, the controls over notifying next to kin, personal property, injured and burials, and reporting to the commission, which is one of the key contract compliance issues. We actually have staff out at the medical examiner's office today. We've done a lot of walkthroughs through the key process areas. We've obtained the database from the medical examiner's office from the period of October 1st, 2019 to 1231, 2021, of all the decedents coming into the medical examiner's office. We've done a review over that database. We've determined out of the 8,000 decedents coming in, about 86% of them come in and go out within 10 days. So we're trying to determine where we need to do our sampling so we can go through the case records of all the individuals. We've broken it down to those that have been in the medical examiner's office between 10 and 50 days, those between 50 and 100, and those over 100 plus those that are still there. So what we'll be doing is picking a sample, going through all the case files, determining what steps were done for notification, identification, and then coming up with uh, some recommendations for the medical examiner's office. Another area we're looking at too is controls over cash receipts because there is a significant, significant amount of cash receipts that does come into the medical examiner's office. So that's uh, kind of like a highlight of what we're doing. But like I said, we are at the medical examiner's office this week. Thank you for that, Ms. Cora. It does sound like you're going to address some of the issues that were raised today and raised in the PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, and you're going to use that PowerPoint as part of your research or whatever preparation for the audit, correct? Yes. And as we do our testing of case files, not only will we be looking at the individuals that have come up in the news stories, we're also going to right. pick a sample from other individuals. Uh, at this point, uh, because you have started, uh, Ms. Cora, uh, are you willing or is it appropriate to take input from committee members uh, that have some concerns of areas that they think need to be looked into that maybe are not on your list right now? Sure. Uh, yeah, because uh, I, I would like, I, I want the context of your report since you're looking at all of these things too. Um, and, uh, so on some of the questions being raised here today, uh, I'm going to wait on the, uh, 
on the report of the Auditor General, uh, okay. which will re really help me uh, understand what is and what is not uh, in terms of this. So, but I just wanted uh, committee members to have this uh, in their brain. What are the what are the discussions we've had? What's coming up in the audit in preparation for a discussion of possibly re-upping the contract uh, and all of that. I guess it's going to be sometime uh, in August, I would think. Uh, the contract is up uh, September 30. Is that correct? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so, by, yeah. mm -hmm. by mid to late August, mm -hmm. we either need to say, yeah, and here's the new contract and go get them, U of M, and we appreciate your work. Or, nope, we're going in another direction. And that all has to be done by uh, late August or so. So uh, so I, I just want people to have that timeline in their mind uh, as we're speaking about these reports today. Can uh, I also indicate something else too? Yes, ma'am. We're also, we worked with the uh, University of Michigan's internal audit department. They had done an audit of this area yeah. a few years ago. And we're going to we're coordinating with the areas of audit. We're the ones we're looking at, then they'll be looking at other areas, so that we're not we're coordinating our efforts. Not okay. concentrating on the same thing. Okay. Well, I do appreciate that. Better. I, yeah, I know the audit came, and I is coming, so I appreciate uh, the detail and the heads up on that. And I just want to thank the U of M for their presentation today. Uh, that's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair Colleen. Uh, are there any other questions from commissioners? All right. All right. So what I want to do is allow uh, for public uh, comments. Um, actually, this is um, this is the only thing on our agenda today, which is such a change for us. <laughs> So what we will do is we'll just go to the next item. Madam Clerk. If such other matters as may be properly submitted before the committee. And they, there are none. So we can go to the next item. Public comments. All right. And now we will open it up for Hi. public comments and under public comments. We'll give you two minutes and uh, we do not respond to your comments. We just listen and um, we'll go ahead with the first comment from Mr. Is it uh, Shram? Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Uh, so my name is Timothy Shram. Uh, I'm a licensed funeral director uh, in the state of Michigan. Uh, own and operate two funeral homes in uh, Wayne County. Just uh, one second, please. Can can mm -hmm. you mute um, whoever's talking, or if you can tell who's talking? I think I muted the person. Okay, thank you. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, thank you again, Commissioner. Um, so again, uh, licensed funeral director, been practicing in funeral service for thirty four years. Um, and one, the, the first thing I would like to offer to the, the commission, the committee, um, you know, anytime you would like any uh, information or input from funeral directors, I'm more than willing to be a resource. Um, you know, Dr. Schmidt was exactly correct in the fact of, um, you know, m most decedents being available for release with death certificates. Um, on the uh, day of autopsy. Um, and he had mentioned, you know, an average stay of eight days. Um, just so the committee understands, that could be caused for, you know, a number of reasons. Um, first of all, um, certainly as you've experienced, right, family notification. Um, second of all, as funeral directors, I can tell you, you know, there is a right of disposition priority next of kin line 
uh, to handle crema or handle uh, final disposition arrangements. And sometimes uh, there is a disagreement um, between those of the same uh, priority level, um, which may oftentimes have to go to probate court to be settled, uh, which in itself uh, can be um, uh, five, seven, 10 business day process uh, for that client family. Um, it, it, oftentimes, as an example, we are working with a family right now where um, they are all out of state. And so we're trying to line everything up so that when they get you know, when they get into town that, you know, the, the arrangements are all, all have been completed. Deceased is in our care. Preparation work has been completed. So there's a number of reasons why there could potentially be um, that delay for eight days. Um, and as a practicing funeral director, I would absolutely agree with um, Dr. Schmidt's assessment of, of, decedents being ready with a death certificate um, on the day of the autopsy and or inspection. Um, what I may differ with is that um, oftentimes, at least what we're experiencing at our funeral home, um, and I think there are other funeral directors that are on this call um, that would agree, uh, when we transfer the decedent into our care. Um, it's been two minutes. Okay. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go ahead, just to, can you finish your- All right, your so statement? I'll be very, or very quickly, right? Okay. Oftentimes death certificates are incomplete when we transfer the decedent into our care. One of the questions that was never answered was the length of time to issue a cremation permit. Um, our firm has experienced significant delays in the issuance of cremation permits. Um, our process is we enter a request, we wait 24 hours for a response, we enter a second request. Uh, at 48 hours, at 72 hours, we make a phone call. And at, at 96 hours, I have to send a staff member in person to the medical examiner's office in order to get a cremation permit. And there is a distinct lack of response by telephone. We call, we have a deceased at a home death in which we want to confirm time of death, doctor's name, and the medical examiner is releasing. And it, it, it took us three hours the other day to get that confirmation. Because every time we call, we're placed on hold, we wait on hold for over 30 minutes, we hang up and we call again, and the same process happened numerous times. Um, we had an incident where we called multiple times throughout the day, six times, as a matter of fact, in which the phone was never answered. The seventh time the phone was answered, we had 12 cremation permits in the queue. And the response was, what two do you want me to approve and I'll get them done now. That's unacceptable. There needs to be a clear cut process in which cremation permits are returned within 24 hours. Washtenaw County, Oakland County, uh, we can we do a cremation permit request today by 2 p.m. We have the permit in hand by 5 p.m. This process needs to speed up. Thank you. Uh, next we'll have uh, Billy. Just for clarification, are we speaking with the two minute time frame? Yes, we are. Two minutes, yes. Hello, my name is Billy Schultz from Southgate. And I am here to say that Dr. Evans needs to release these mandates off our children. Our children are not yours, and I did not lay in bed with you to have them. It needs to be up to the parents and the children on what type of medical, on their medical decisions. This is America, the land of the free. We have the right to medical freedom. You cannot mandate one religious county, just like you cannot force one medical practice on a person. We are herbalists in 
you need to keep your medical beliefs off my children's faces and out of their bodies. You are not their father and you are not our God. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it uh, Kemp next? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The um, very good report by Dr. Myers and Dr. Wilson, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, I want to emphasize what um, uh, Mr. Schramm was talking about. I'm in Oakland County. I don't know if you're home in Oakland County, but I do a lot of Wayne County uh, death certificates. And my question and is basically the phone issues. I, and I know that the hospice nurses I talk with a lot of hospices. Matter of fact, I have Angela Hospice Medical Director here now, uh, her husband, uh, just don't answer the phone. They just don't answer the phone. And when they do answer it, there are specific investigators who are just nasty, just rude. Um, I can't put it any other way uh, that we've complained for years, years about them answering the phone, just giving us just information, time of death, who's signing, where do I go, what phone number. Simple as that. Uh, the other thing is the cremation permits, which I don't understand. We're the largest county in, in Michigan, and we can't, we still don't own EDRS, electronic, da, electronic uh, death registration system, all the way. Um, even though they give us paper death certificates still, they're the last ones that I know of that still give paper death certificates when we can retrieve them right online. Uh, not a big issue. We get them on paper. I just don't understand why they can't do them electronically. And they never answer EDRS in terms of cremation permits. It is a revenue producing process. They charge us $75 every time you do a, a, a permit. To me, as a business person, an uh, investigator or a clerk could do this with an algorithm, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, and approve these permits in an expedition manner because I personally have 18 people back waiting for permits. Um, and we call, you know, it's almost bad, so bad that we can't even. We're afraid to call. A lot of funeral homes are not even on the line right now because they're afraid of retribution. They're not going to answer the phone. And I think it's just, it's, it hurts me that you've got to send somebody down there to wait hours, to give them one uh, cremation permit, they come out with another that's inefficient. Uh, and I, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I just think that it should be, it's revenue producing. This is not revenue neutral. Uh, a permit is a simple thing and it produces a lot of money. Um, I don't know what the Auditor General says, but I'm sure that, uh, you know, that it's there. Uh -huh. But it's just, it's not new, so. Thank you, Mr. Kemp. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is it B, uh, K, the K, the K, Christine? <laughs> yes, hi, I'm sorry, thank you. No problem. Mm -hmm. Um, I apologize for being off topic on this meeting, but I'm a persistent parent when it comes to my children. During yesterday's commission meeting, you mentioned frustration with residents calling regarding the mask mandate. You stated that the commissioners have nothing to do with this. As a resident and a parent, I'm frustrated as well. The reason I've been reaching out to the commissioners is because I don't know who else to turn to. You stated I should reach out to the health uh, officer. Is that Miss Jordan? If it is, I'd like to let you know that I've tried to email her with the uh, email address a commissioner provided me. However, I received an undeliverable response. Mr. Killian also just replied to an email and gave me a new email address. That also, as I just tried to send an email just now, came back and would not go through. I emailed you many. La uh, many I emailed many of you last week um, with a letter. This was my first attempt at trying to email Miss Jordan. It's just not going through. I've asked on social media, and others have had the same like, issue. It might be like four minutes. They only get two minutes to talk, and I should be in the. Uh, is um. In order to free up time, if you guys could please provide correct um, and a direct working email for the health officer responsible for the mandate, we would all greatly appreciate this. Without being able to contact our health officer directly, I sadly fear that you will continue to receive communications from frustrated residents who have no one else to go to. We elected you and are looking for assistance. 
I look to you as someone with direct contact with an individual who is responsible for masking only our children. I'm asking for your help as my elected officials. Sadly, as an elected official, you do carry responsibility of assisting your constituents. If you don't help, the positions, your position are the only ones that we the people have control over. Any, uh, everyone who calls wants the same thing. It's beyond time to unmask our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, Madam Clerk, can you leave the email for, in Wayne County. for the uh, health director? They said they had the wrong email. So if you could put that in the, in the chat, that would be great. Hold on. I'm sorry, did you say something? Okay. Um, uh, Mark? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a very brief comment. Um, something that the, the medical examiner's office might consider is working with our funeral directors association to have a funeral home liaison that would have regularly scheduled meetings with the medical examiner's office, just so we don't lose momentum of, of these conversations. Thanks. Thank you. Let's see, um, Tamara. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a few months ago, Commissioner Anderson commented that parents were not offering any solutions, and I think that was fair. Um, however, when we've actually tried to contact the administration, you know, we know actually who that's who's responsible for the mandates um, and they fail to reciprocate with any or all attempts to actually have a dialogue with us. Plus, we have several commissioners, including some in this call who demean and or work against constituent concerns. It is near impossible for us all to even align on what the actual problem is that needs to be solved. So us parents and educators in Wayne and Oakland counties have decided to collaborate on a solution without you. Together, nearly 1,000 of us have crowdsourced funds to obtain legal counsel and yesterday took our first of several planned actions. I'll read an excerpt from a press release issued last night. Parents in Oakland County, Michigan, on behalf of themselves and their children, have filed a lawsuit against the Oakland County Health Department and three school districts. The lawsuit requests that the court declare the mask mandate issued by Leanne Stafford in her capacity as the health officer for Oakland County violate state law and constitutional protections, that the order be rescinded and an injunction issued barring any similar orders in the future. Plaintiff's attorney, David Coleman stated, it's a shame we must request that the court uphold our client's legal rights. This is an improper attempt to mandate daily mask wearing that even the CDC acknowledges has little efficacy. Defendants have no legal authority to issue or enforce the mask order. The order clearly violates our client's rights pursuant to state law and the constitution. I will forward a copy of this press release to Ms. Lane for distribution for those on this call who request it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it Shannon? Hi, yes, this is Shannon. Okay. I'm just following up with um, parents concerned about our children being masked up here in Wayne County. Um, I've been on every home, all, every meeting with my concerns and these kids are in dire need to get these masks off. Um, I work with social workers, I'm a nurse, we work in the district here and uh, there's 60 kids with anxiety that we're trying to treat. The mental health is just, these kids can't survive and there's no evidence right. that these masks work. We need these masks, I'm in full support of this lawsuit that's out. It is spreading like wildfire and you need to rescind this order, tell Mr. Evans, he is making um, a big mistake. These masks are impacting our children psychologically, mentally, and it needs to stop. And I am um, full support of the, the lawsuit. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller. Miller, last name. She's on mute. Okay. Kelly Miller. We can't yes. hear you. 
Okay. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Um, I thank you so much uh, for the reports that have gone forth uh, to all my colleagues that have spoken before me. Uh, and I just wanted to um, piggyback on um, the comments from uh, Shram and Kemp. Um, as a funeral director here in uh, Detroit, uh, with uh, most of the clients that we serve uh, do uh, come out of Wayne County, we do have several cases that um, require cremation permits that are tied up in the process that uh, we have to go through um, through Wayne County. Um, I, it's, 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 it is a financial issue. Um, not only uh, it's a time sensitive issue, but I want to take away the, take away the funding, take away the time and just realize that um, we're working with with families and be sensitive to that. Um, people who um, people who um, want their loved ones back. Um, um, we don't have the same issues in. Um, Oakland County, Macomb, Washington, we're able to get cremation permits back uh, relatively quickly. But here in Wayne County, um, it's time prohibitive, it's cost prohibitive, um, the way we have to chase after um, getting permits. And, um, and, and we're chasing after them with, um, with a, a great deal of passion because of the families that, uh, the families that we serve. Um, for case in point, I have a, um, cremation uh, permit that I've requested for a fetus. And to us, it may be just a fetus, but to, a, to the family that I'm serving, it's, it's a dream cancel. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's hope that is, um, that's failed. And um, it breaks my heart to, um, to tell families that, you know, we're, we're waiting on Wayne County to respond so that we can get their loved one back. And I know that it's not an issue just for um, my firm, but for my colleagues as well. Uh -huh. And I haven't heard any solutions um, yet, but I thank you for hearing us today. Mr. Baker McCormick, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other public comments? I would like to speak. And you are? My name is Trisha Hagen. All right, go right ahead. All right, um, so I wanna just say that this year will be three years on a homicide investigation on my brother-in-law. Now, when he was found in 2019 and was considered unknown when he had a driver's license, debit card, credit card, he also had surgeries done. They had no medical hardware, but he had hernia surgery. He had clavicle surgery. And when I joined the Zoom meeting back in October, I was told you could use that to identify. A driver's license throws you not in the unknown category. So he was thrown as an unknown male and sent a year later to Kaufman to be cremated under an unknown male. Now, I've listened to the Zoom meetings this time and last time. And when we talk about the errors within the system, we're mentioning the errors you see on the news. We're not mentioning the errors that people can't get on the news to say what is happening to their families and their loved ones. This is very unacceptable unaccept because of the fact he didn't get identified till last year. His case, his homicide case has not been looked into. So the person that shot him over two years ago, it's gonna be so hard to find any connection there. And that, that's all I have to say. But people with families, any of you with kids to sit there and wonder when you're staying in contact and all of it was there, his ID, debit cards, everything, everything was there. And you still put as an unknown male and cremated. And we didn't even get his ashes till this year. This is 2019 we are talking about. 
Thank you. Um, Rochelle? My house. Hi. Yes. Go Hi, right ahead. Is, okay. My name is Rochelle Nyhouse, and I am from Genesee County. Um, I have been speaking with some of the other parents around the state recently. Um, I just wanted to speak with the Wayne County, um, anybody in Wayne County who will hear me and listen. I'm a mom who is a mother of three athletes and uh, we've just always been a very active family. Um, I wasn't, in the beginning when the mask mandate first came out, I figured it would be a thing that would come and go because I figured they put it in for an emergency situation, put it in place for an emergency situation. And that common sense would bring us out of it because we all know that we have to, God made our bodies up with oxygen as basically our gasoline for our bodies to run. And if you take a car, I, I just don't understand how educated people can keep mm -hmm. this in place when, um, you know, we know if you look at a car, it needs gasoline to run. And if you don't, if it doesn't get the full amount of gasoline through the pipes, then the car's not going to function. Well, that's basically what it is with our brains and oxygen and every other organ in our body. The blood is the source of our life. It needs oxygen to be, uh, to be used and our, for our bodies to run and function. Um, my, since my son had his injury, uh, we have been to doctor's appointments almost uh, every day on a daily basis. Um, he's in excruciating, extreme pain every day. He wants to die. He is a senior this year. He's had everything from all of his sports taken away from him. He's online in school now because he had immediately come out of school. Um, I can't give his whole story, but if anybody wants to look up my page on Facebook, it's Rochelle Nyhaus, N-E-U-H-A-U-S. Um, my He was forced to run for two hours at a basketball practice after they lost a game. Um, it was March of last year and he came home and collapsed and he's been having um, uh, side effects from that ever since where he has a brain injury where um, he's just in excruciating pain and he's lost a lot of his memory function. He went from straight, all straight A student to being able to function. He's got, um, he's duly enrolled in college. He can barely do any of that work on his own now without help. He's never needed help his entire 11 years prior to being in uh -huh. school. In a senior year, he can't function. So um, I'm just calling on everybody at the commissioner's level because I know that the state put something in place that really couldn't be followed through on because it's not something that we can do to survive. We cannot wear masks for the rest of our lives. We can't wear masks any longer. People are dropping dead. People are getting very sick. I have had just my, my um, email and everything has been blown up with messages from parents that you all should be receiving at the commissioner's level and the health department level of, of the just the students who have tried to commit suicide, um, <laughs> students who have new asthma, all kinds of health issues, ear issues, um, even, even eye issues, heart issues, lung issues, you name it. It all comes from it's hypoxia time. in the brain being cut off with oxygen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any um, emails, Madam Clerk? From anyone? Yes, we do have a few emails. Okay, if you can read those. Thank you. The first email is from Michael Wheaton. CDC website shows that Wayne County is still in a state of high community transmission, but the case and test positivity rates are free falling and reaching highs last month due to the Omicron variant. And the latest four week forecast show this trend to continue. Meanwhile, the county's hospitalization rates already much lower as a percentage of cases than for previous surges are trending downward. And the forecast for the state of Michigan predicts this improvement to continue. There is no conclusive proof that the countywide school mask mandate provided any resistance to the Omicron surge in this county. Likewise, the mask mandate won't have any significant effect on the current decline. All we can do at this point is ride the wave of a variant that is highly contagious, but also much less virulent than its predecessors and enjoy the vast natural immunity that it leaves behind. Meanwhile, we are bombarded almost daily with social media pictures of pro-mandate politicians taking massive selfies with mass school children, including First Lady Jill Biden, New York State Governor Kathy Hochul, 
Michigan Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, and Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams, it is obvious that our leaders do not take their restrictions seriously when they are forced to follow them and they do not believe in the so-called science that is driving mass mandates. This county should end the school mask mandate and offer N95 masks to anyone who wants or needs them to provide, provide actual protection for themselves and their loved ones. Wayne County should join the growing list of states and counties that are ending their mask mandates in the name of science and sanity. Michael Wheaton. This is from Lena Honeycutt. I am a concerned parent and work in the early education system in Wayne County. I am so disappointed in the mandate. I'm so disappointed in the mandate that Wayne County has had in place since August of 2021. I work with three and four year olds in a church setting. Parishioners can come and go into my facility. However, if you are a parent in the preschool, you must wear a mask. It's ludicrous. It's ludicrous, it's ludicrous to put a mask on a three or four year old child. I have been in this business for over 25 years and this is detrimental on these young children. This needs to end so these children can have a normal school experience and build their immune system, which is what is supposed to happen at this age. The amount of children that I see that are withdrawing is overwhelming. Your tyrannic mandates need to end. If masks do not work at this age, there is snot in them, they are wet, they end up off the face, not worn properly. I see it as pure political. People want a choice, not a mandate. This is from Laura. Heberger, last name, H-E-B-R-E-R. -E -E Hello, as a Livonia resident and parent of a school-aged child in Wayne County, I like my public comment voice in today's meeting on my behalf. Parental choice to, our, as, to mass our children or not should be implemented immediately. It's been two plus years that our children have been subjected to the harmful, quite frankly, ill-advised and ineffective use of mass in K-12 schools. Only as parents know best for our children. Only we as parents are aware of our kids' risk level related to COVID-19. Only we know whether our children has had COVID and possesses natural immunity. If parents want their children to be masked, by all means, they should be in charge of that decision. If parents want their children to be unmasked, the same rule should, should apply. The long past time that this overreaction ends. Multiple studies have shown that not only are children that not only are healthy children at zero risk of serious COVID outcomes, but further studies have demonstrated that masking children is not only ineffective at reducing spread, but physically and emotionally harmful. So statistically speaking, healthy children are at higher risk of dying from the flu, from a car crash, or from drowning and dying from COVID. Local leaders need to follow the data demonstrating these facts that children are not at risk, applying a one-size-fits-all approach to a population of people with zero is insanity. Our children have had enough. It's time to let parents choose the best course of action for our kids. This is from Barbara Morad. Does the Wayne County Health Human and Veteran Services still have a mass mandate for schools? There was an emergency order issue 82721, but according to the website, masks are only recommended. Could you please clarify? Furthermore, if masks are still mandatory, please know that this is based on outdated information and we need to stop masking our children. Kids are getting rashes on their faces, cavities, and our pre-K, kindergartners, and first graders are unable to properly learn how to read or pronounce words. Thanks in advance for your clarification. And also says, the health department is still mandating masks in schools, even through the Public Act 87 of 2021, Section 250 states, the director for Local health officers shall not issue or enforce any orders or other directives that require an individual in the state who is under the age of 18 to wear a face mask or face covering. This is from Christine Pachaska. It says, Ms. Jordan, please allow emails to be sent to you. I've never sent, I've never sent prior emails, yet I am receiving an undeliverable response. Why am I blocked? This is unprofessional. And that is the last of the email comments. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we will move to the next item. Chairman. Is there a motion? 
there a motion for I'm adjournment? coming off mute and I'm making that motion, Madam Chair. I move to adjourn. Thank you. Uh, any one support? I'll support my own motion. <laughs> well, where, um, let's see, Commissioner Dobb, you support? Okay, is she not I on? Support. All right. All right, well, meeting adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Have Madam Chair. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.